So now that we've covered O genesis, we're going to be looking at the cycle that governs that process. And that cycle will be referred to as the menstrual cycle. We'll entitle this next flowchart, menstrual cycle one. And what I really urge you to do is look at figure 46.14. This, in my opinion, is actually one of the best, maybe the best figure in all of Campbell's biology. If you can understand this figure, if you can label this figure, imagine you take the labels off and you have to label it from memory. If you can memorize this figure, you can understand the majority of this entire lecture in a great, really expansive manner. And I highly suggest putting a lot of time and devoting a lot of time to understanding this figure. Much of what we're going to cover now is going to look at this figure in more detail. But again, that figure is a nice summary of everything that we'll say from this point forward and towards the end of the lecture. So let's begin by looking at the menstrual cycle and a little bit of background before we get into the actual sort of events of the cycle. From the background's perspective, what we first want to do is a basic definition of the menstrual cycle. And a very simple way of understanding it is that stating that it is just going to be the thickening of the part of the uterus known as the endometrium. Remember, the endometrium is the inner part of the uterus where the embryo will implant. You need to thicken it in preparation for that implantation. And this is going to be before ovulation. Essentially, this is a pregnancy preparation technique, thickening of the endometrium before ovulation so that once ovulation happens, fertilization happens. So once fertilization happens, zygote comes and implants into the endometrium and develops there. So that is our sort of broad overview of what this cycle is. Now, what we want to sort of hash out and sort of compare it to is something that's also seen in the animal kingdom called the estrus cycle. So this is different than the menstrual cycle. The estrus cycle is going to be a cycle in which we see an animal um, display an increased amount of fertility at this time. We consider the animal to be fertile and also a common phrase used for the estrus cycle is the fact that the animal is in heat in the sense that when we say something is fertile and it's in heat, we're simply meaning that the animal is sexually receptive. It is capable of reproducing at a higher rate and at a, sex, at a uh, much more successful rate at this time. So receptive. Specifically, this is going to be a cycle because the sexual receptivity is going to be at only certain times of a year. So it's going to be at a certain times of a year. A lot of times you see that animals will have increased sexual receptiveness. Thus, they are following an estrous cycle because let's say they are more likely to mate in the, uh, let's say, prior to spring so that when you have birth, you know, three, four, five, six months down the line, whatever it may be, the children are going to be born, the offspring will be born um, in the middle of spring. They'll have plenty of nutrients with plenty of plants, etc. That's all about the estrus cycle. What's of interest to us is actually the menstrual cycle. So this is different. Different cycle, differently, different for the following reason. The menstrual cycle is also a cycle, definitely, but it's specifically uh, going to govern an intermittent, intermittent and cyclic fertility in humans and other organisms, but humans are of focus to us, females. So this is going to show that females will have intermittent, so sometimes they will have more, sometimes they will have less, and a cyclical amount of this more or less fertility. So at certain times, they will be more fertile than others. But the thing is, the major difference between this and the estrous cycle is that this difference in fertility is not synchronized with the time of year. It is not synchronized. It is not like the estrous cycle. So it is not synchronized with um, also sexual receptiveness. So just because there's an increased amount of sexual receptiveness in, let's say, a female woman, this does not mean that she has an increased amount of fertility. It's because of the fact that her fertility is independent of her sexual receptiveness. This is exemplified in human females and many other primates, this menstrual cycle that's, ir that's regardless and irrespective of the fertility and in-heat sexual receptiveness that's seen in estrous cycles. Okay, so that's our basic background here. Just remember, no in heat in female uh, humans. 
So now, let's look at a broad overview of this very complex, oftentimes overwhelming cycle for many students. Um, we're going to try to break it down as simply and as effectively and as possible so that you can really understand and appreciate the complexity and importance of this cycle. So, what we'll do first in this video is a um, general cycle overview. Before we actually get into the specific parts of it and the specific steps, it can get very overwhelming. I just want to do a very broad look at this menstrual cycle that is displayed in females. First, I want to make sure that you understand something. This is a complex cycle. Do not be frustrated if you cannot remember it the first time. It's impossible. It's a very complex cycle because it involves many different parts. It involves the hypothalamus. It involves the anterior pituitary. It involves the ovaries. And it also involves the uterus. And in addition to this, it's not just the fact that these, uh, these organs, these structures are involved. These structures are endocrinology endocrinologically evolved as well because they're going to release hormones and those hormones are going to act on other hormones and there's going to be many tropic effects occurring all adding to the complexity. So let me show you a bit of this complexity by doing a broad look at the key glands and hormones of this cycle. So key glands, the key things that will secrete hormones um, of this cycle. Key glands plus hormones and of course, this is actually going to follow a hormone cascade pathway. This hormone cascade pathway is more specifically referred to as an HPG axis, but we don't need to get into those details. That just stands for hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonad axis. Um, and let's see how it follows that route. So what we're going to start off with is the first and foremost, always the primary structure in many hormonal cycles, and that is the hypothalamus. So we're in the brain. We have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to release something called, release and produce something called GnRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone. Remember, R stands for releasing. Releasing means it will cause a further event to happen. It will not inhibit, but it will promote. GnRH is going to go through the portal vein and reach what? GnRH always wants to reach the anterior pituitary, AP for anterior pituitary. This anterior pituitary will then release two very important hormones. It will release FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and also LH, luteinizing hormone, both of which are going to go from the anterior pituitary, so we've covered the hypothalamus, we've covered the anterior pituitary, into the uterus. Their sort of target tissue is the, into the ovaries, I should say. Their target tissue is the ovaries, so let's do that. So they both go towards the ovaries. Okay, that's their sort of target. Upon the excitation from GnRH, they're going to release FSH, FSH, and LH. Those will go to the ovaries. What is the ovaries going to take with this? What is, what is the ovaries going to do with this message of FSH and LH? The ovaries will do the following. They will produce uh, two major hormones. The first one uh, is going to be, or one that we'll put on the side for right now, is progesterone. And the other hormone that the ovaries will release is called estrogen. Okay. But specifically what we want to say about estrogen, because estrogen is a broad class of hormones, um, estrogen is going to be the principal sex hormone, the principal major sex hormone, much like testosterone is in males. This is what we see in females, estrogen. But the specific form that you want to remember is estradiol. It's in the form of estradiol. So estrogen in the form of estradiol is released by the ovaries as a result of an FSH and LH um, entry into this anatomical structure. So the ovaries have gland sort of secretion capabilities and they secrete estradiol. Estradiol is very important because it's going to be specifically secreted by, secreted by the follicle cells and also the corpus luteum, FC and CL. Follicle cells are part of the follicle structure. Once the follicle loses the secondary oocyte, it turns into a temporary endocrine gland. That temporary endocrine gland is the corpus luteum. The temporary endocrine gland is named such because it releases temporarily estradiol, which is a hormone. Thus, CL, corpus luteum, is a temporary endocrine gland. In addition, what does estra estradiol do? Estradiol is in charge of sex characteristics. Much like testosterone is in charge of male sex characteristics, estradiol is in charge of female sex characteristics, both primary and also secondary. And I ran out of room here, but what you can write underneath the primary sex characteristics is anytime you have primary sex characteristics, it's about the development 
and growth of sex organs, okay? So that's a primary sex characteristic, the development and growth of sex organs, whereas a secondary characteristic, secondary sex characteristic, as a result of estradiol doing its job, would be things like breast development, would be things like the pelvic broadening, the broadening of hips that's seen in females, usually around the time of puberty, and the fat and muscle distribution also that is going to be exemplified within puberty. All of these pu puberty events that are a scene, physically seen, are known as secondary sex characteristics, and the primary ones are usually internal, the development and growth of sex organs. So that's what estradiol does, and estradiol also is going to be important for one more job. It stimulates the endometrium preparation. It stimulates endometrium preparation. What is the preparation for? The preparation is thickening, and that thickening is for a possible implantation of a zygote that has been fertilized. But that may not happen, and we'll see what happens if it does not happen later on. Progesterone is the other hormone that is secreted by the ovaries, secreted uh, in a way that this progesterone will mostly be secreted specifically by the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum secretes both estradiol and progesterone, but mainly progesterone. Um, this is going to be a, uh, a hormone that completes. So if we said that this stimulates endometrium preparation, this is actually what completes endometrium preparation. So let's write that down. Endometrium prep. That's what progesterone is involved in. It's always involved in pregnancy. It's a big, big pregnancy hormone. And another function we should write down is that it stimulates the endometrium glands. Stimulates, I'll just write endo glands for endometrium glands to secrete a nutrient fluid. Now, why would we want to randomly secrete a nutrient fluid that's going to be uh, from the endometrium. Well, that's because something needs nutrients. What do you think needs nutrients at the endometrium? The developing zygote, the developing uterus, the developing womb, right? The developing uh, fetus, I should say. This is all going to be happening at the uterus. So this progesterone hormone is basically going to be uh, secreted by the corpus luteum and the target tissue for progesterone is probably going to be uterine tissue because of this endometrium relationship that it has. So that is a very sort of broad overview of what happens during this cycle. Both of these are separated into ovarian and uterine cycles, as we'll see in the next video. But for right now, just understand this basic hormone axis that we have developed throughout the menstrual cycle. Finally, the menstrual cycle is a cycle for the following reason. It is repeated consistently every 28 days approximately in uh, females, in sexually mature females. It's repeated every 28 days unless, unless fertilization occurs. If fertilization occurs, it is no longer going to occur. What's going to happen is the body will go into overdrive. It will go into pregnancy preparation mode, and it will be ready to house a possible pregnancy and maintain the pregnancy and then give birth. Once it's given birth, it will then return to this 28-day cycle until we reach a point called menopause, which we'll talk about later. So that's our final sort of look at this overview of menstrual cycle. Now let's get into the nitty-gritty details of this process.